Hey everybody, thanks for being with us today. After a few weeks of looking at some other topics, we are jumping back in and rejoining our study of the book of Joshua. But before we dive into it, Katie Kripain is going to open us up in prayer today. Scott and Katie have been a vital part of the New Day family for a long time now. And Katie's faith is one that's really been forged in the fire. So it is a privilege to have her lead us today. Would you join with her as she takes us to the Lord in prayer? Good morning, New Day. Aloha from the island of Maui. Scott and I are so, so blessed and excited to be here on a little getaway. And it is a glorious morning. And I've been asked to um, give the prayer this morning. And I'm so excited about doing that. It is um, really hard to not just be so present to God's creation when you're in a place like this. But it got me thinking the other day as I was just like staring off looking at waves and cloud formations and everything, Re regardless of where we are, there's always something to be seen in God's glorious creation. Every day he paints something new for us to see. So I pray that wherever you are today, you might be able to notice um, what God has to show you out in his wondrous creation. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your never ending presence, um, your never ending grace, your never ending mercy. I pray that God, wherever any, everyone is today, whether you are um, watching on Zoom or whether you're together at the Hub, I pray, Lord, that we would all find community in you, that we would remember that whether we're together or apart, God, we are brothers and sisters in Christ and unified through our love and faith in Jesus. I pray, God, that um, those that might be struggling today or hurting, dealing with hard things, God, that they would feel seen and known by you, that they would know, God, that you are with them. Um, God, you never leave us or forsake us, and I'm so grateful for that truth. I pray that you'd meet people with comfort um, and with grace uh, wherever they are today. I pray for Jeff, too, as he brings the message this morning, God. Wake our hearts up right now, Lord, to receive what it is that you have for us. I pray um, that we would all, God, be uh, a little more alive in you this morning and be able to just receive what it is you have for us in this glorious day. Um, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit, um, and just for your never-ending love. God, we're so blessed and so rich in you. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Aloha, new day. Well, I don't know about you, but for me, at this point in the pandemic, I think a few extra steps might be a good idea. And so I was thinking maybe an outdoor field trip would be in order. What do you say? Let's go get on that bus. Hello, I'm very happy to be the driver of the yellow bus that brought your pastor to this historic place in Minneapolis. Uh, we've lived in the area for over 30 years and have never seen it before. So it's a great introduction for me as well. Uh, you're gonna look and see the very top of this uh, tower and I'm gonna turn it over to your pastor again. Bye-bye. So we've hiked today up to uh, this very high point in Minneapolis. You can hear how winded we are. Uh, <laughs> And at the top, you find this, which is known as the Witch's Hat Tower. It's not too hard to see how it got its name. The green peak on the tower makes it easily recognizable from far away. It was designed by Frederick Kaplan back in 1913 to increase water pressure for firefighters in the area. Minnesota is so flat that you find such water towers almost everywhere, but none of the rest are wearing a hat. And they don't have a bandstand at the top either. But that idea didn't really work out. It turns out narrow winding stairs aren't really built for big heavy instrument cases. On the plaque above me, it says that this water tower is standing at the highest point in Minneapolis. But actually that's not true. It was an honest mistake. There's so little variation in height that nothing in Minneapolis even reaches a thousand feet above sea level. The nearby Deming Heights Park nudged out the witch's hat by about 20 feet. Plus, that park has an elf door in a tree. But that's for a different field trip. 
Well, that's about all we have time for today. We got a long trip back ahead of us, so let's head back to the bus and get on with the sermon. Special thanks to my father-in-law for being our guest driver to that exotic locale. I'll let you in on a little secret if you promise not to tell anybody. I don't have that strong of a tie-in between this field trip and our story today. Although there is a little bit of one because what I was looking for there in Minnesota was a high hill. I was, I was looking for the highest elevation that I could find there. And to happen to find two places that were sort of competing for the highest point, that ties in a little bit more because what we're looking at today in our story actually has to do with geography and these two mountains, these two hills really, that uh, play a significant part in how the story unfolds. So there you go. Uh, when we last left Israel, they had crossed over into the Promised Land, crossed the Jordan River. They'd had that just spectacular, miraculous battle at Jericho where they had won so decisively. And then they had gone into another battle thinking that they would be able to expect the same thing only to be just completely defeated because it turned out that there was some sin that was happening in their ranks. And so they had to stop and deal with that. So early on in their time here in the promised land, they had to, they had to address that. And then they, they went and refought that battle and then won the second time. So they've been through all this. And now at this point, the, the narrative shifts to a different scene. And that's where we pick it up in Joshua chapter 8. Verse 30, take a look at what it says. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. So what's about to unfold here is fulfilling some instructions that Moses had given the people back 40 years ago before they had crossed into the promised land. This is what he told them they were supposed to do when they got there. And now all this time later, Joshua is carrying it out exactly right down to the letter. So he's building this altar and it says he built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on stones a copy of the law of Moses. All the Israelites with their elders, officials, and judges were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Both the foreigners living among them and the native-born were there. Half of the people stood in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had formerly commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. This is easily one of the least relatable sections in the book of Joshua. There's so much going on in here that doesn't feel like it has any connection point to our modern lives. And yet, if we can sit with it, if we can spend some time here, I think we'll begin to see that there's actually something very deep and profound going on that does speak directly to where we're at today. But let's get our bearings first on where this is taking place. So the people cross over the River Jordan. They have that big epic battle at Jericho. Uh, and then they begin making their way north to these two side-by-side -side mountains. Mountains is probably a generous term for what we're looking at here because they're really more glorified hills. They're each about 3,000 feet in elevation. Today, you'd find the Palestinian town of Nablus down in between them. That was the biblical city of Shechem. But if you, if you look at these hills from above, you'll see that they're kind of unusual in their shape. 
They, they each have this indentation in them. So it's almost like you have two horseshoes facing each other. And so they form this natural amphitheater or a, a stadium bowl that makes a great gathering spot for a large group of people like they're doing in this story. And they've tested this out where you can have one person standing at the top of one of these hills and they can talk in a loud voice and have somebody else standing on the top of the other hill and they can hear them perfectly even though that's a mile away. And so if you're looking for a setting where you can have a lot of people who can all uh, hear everything that's being said, this is where you'd want to be. And so it's just perfect for what's going on here. And you go, what was so important that God was wanting all the people collectively to hear this message? Why did this need to take place right now? And you think about what's going on is they're, they're coming into the promised land and it's been nonstop since they got there. They have had battle after battle. It's been a whirlwind. And now they are pausing and they're going back 40 years to something that Moses had told them about. And what it tells me is that when you are in new territory, you need old truth. When you're in new territory, you need old truth. Author Max Dupree tells the story of when his granddaughter Zoe was born prematurely, very prematurely. She was less than one and a half pounds when she was born. She was so tiny that his wedding ring could fit on one of her arms. And doctors were giving her less than a 10% chance of even lasting a few days, let alone surviving, which she did. But the dad had bailed on Max's daughter about a month before Zoe was even born. So a nurse in the ICU turned to Max as the granddad and said, okay, you're now the surrogate father for the next few months. And here's what I need you to do. I need you to come to the hospital every single day and to sit down with her and, and to take the tip of your finger and run it along her skin, her arms and legs very gently. And as you're doing that, I need you to tell her over and over again how much you love her because she needs to be able to connect your voice with your touch. That's what she was going to need to make it. I think that's what we are going to need to make it as well, to be able to connect God's voice with his touch. That's what Israel is doing here. They are, they are remembering who God is. And I think when we are in new territory like we're in right now, when it's, when it's bewildering what it means to be a church or even just to be a Christian in these times, we're not going to make it if we're not staying grounded and, and keeping our footing firmly on these old truths of who God is. I read a really sobering statistic this week. It was from a survey taken in this last year that found that in America, people who call themselves Christians, 52% of them believe that you can achieve your own salvation by simply being a good enough person. That's what Christians are thinking. And you go, that is such a disconnect from our Father and, and His saying to us, that we don't need to earn a relationship with him. That that's something he's offering us in Christ. We've got to reconnect his voice and his touch. And as we look at what Israel is doing here, we see that the way they're going about this is so unusual. Because they are starting off with, of all things, talking about these, these curses. Moses had told them that when they got to this spot, they were to recite a whole list of, of curses associated with disobedience. Uh, and I want to read just a few of them for you from Deuteronomy chapter 27. There, there's a whole list of them. We'll just read a few as examples. The Levites shall recite to all the people of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed is anyone who makes an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of skilled hands, and sets it up in secret. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is anyone who dishonors their father or mother. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is anyone who moves their neighbor's boundary stone. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is anyone who leads the blind astray on the road. Then all the people shall say, Amen. 
Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. Then all the people shall say, Amen. That's just a taste of what the people were reconnecting with here. But I want us to pause and do one of our breakouts right now to just have some reflection on these curses that you just listened to. What stood out to you about them? If you're watching this with other people, take some time to discuss with one another. If you're watching by yourself, maybe just jot down some notes here. But we'll set the timer for two minutes to give you a chance to think about what stood out about these curses. And then we'll come back. Annie Edson Taylor was the first person to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel and survive. She was 63 years old at the time. She got all done and her big takeaway for it was nobody should ever do that again. That is a terrible, terrible idea. And Moses is, is pronouncing all these things and saying these are things that nobody should ever do again. They are terrible, terrible ideas. But it's more than just they have bad consequences. It is that they carry with them this idea of a curse. There is a weight to these that's unbearable. There is, there is this ostracization that takes place. It, it puts us in a state, a, a condition before God and our community uh, that we don't want to be in. It's, it's uh, full of separation for us. It's like carrying around the mark of Cain. And as you look at the things that, that he singles out here, uh, a couple of things emerge that are worth noting. First off is just to see how many times he is making sure that this is good care for the entire community, that this, this is for uh, especially the people who are on the margins and the fringes who don't have a voice. You've got the blind, you've got the, the fatherless and the widows and the foreigners. It's very much concerned about justice for people on the edges of society, which is really worth paying attention to and seeing how much that is on God's heart. But secondly, we see that, that the people are called not just to listen to this list, they are called to engage with it because each time one is read, they're supposed to say amen to it. They're, they're supposed to give their yes to that every time. And, and that is a way of having them really acknowledge and internalize what God's will is for them in this area. And so there's, 
There's no excuse that they don't know it or didn't understand it because they are, they are providing their assent to what is being read. And then we go from the curses over to the blessings. And we find the blessings in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's take a look at some of those. It says, All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. That's a big if. It had said before, if you fully obey the Lord your God. So if you do that, you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. I think what stands out to me as I read through that list of blessings is just how far-reaching and comprehensive God's desire is for his people to know and experience his goodness in all aspects of life. There's nothing that he leaves out here. It's so great because he says he, he wants to bless them in everything they do, in everything they own, in everywhere they go, everybody that they love. It's all included. God's, God's care is so vast and his, his readiness to just pour it all out on them is, is so huge. And so as I look at this scene, I see these these two mountains really representing God's two primary qualities. We've got his holiness and we've got his love. His holiness is the mountain of the curses because these, these standards are laid out and say you, you can't violate these things. And God's trying to safeguard them from experiencing the weight and the grief of these curses. And the people know all too well how easy it is to go there because it only took one person before to ruin that whole battle for them. And, and they probably are very aware of how easy it's going to be for, for, again, just one person in the community to do something against one of these laws that God has laid down. And so uh, they, they are feeling the weight that these curses carry. And then over here, you've got God's love demonstrated in these blessings and, and these, these people also being so keenly aware of the large if that hangs over it regarding their obedience. Um, God's ready with all of it. And also they, they are weak and their track record is not good. And, and so God has them in a place where they can look both directions and they can see both things. And we can see both things. We can see the curses that we can't bear, and we can see the blessings that we don't deserve. And right in this story itself, God, God provides something for the people of Israel in the form of uh, the, the sacrifices, because Joshua builds this altar on Mount Ebal to, to offer sacrifices for the people's sins and their shortcomings here. And Moses talks a lot about how this altar is to be built. Back in 1980, Archaeologists were digging on Mount Ebal, and they, there, there was this mound of rocks there that just looked like rubble. Locals called it the hat. But actually, it was, it was there on purpose to preserve and protect this, this landmark underneath. And as they, as they began to remove those rocks underneath, they found this altar that really fits the description in this passage because it's, it's built of uncut, undressed field stones and it's from about that time period. So you go, why was it that this altar needed to be made from these, these uncut stones? I think, I think a couple of things stand out about that. At first, just the fact that no human hands cut these stones reminds us that, that salvation is of the Lord. It's his doing, not something that we manufacture or bring to the table. But even more specifically than that, I think in the altar itself, 
we have a picture of Christ and what Christ has done for us. Those of you who have been around New Day for a little while might remember a couple of years ago when we did our study from the book of Daniel. And as we got into that, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that Daniel interpreted for him. It was a dream of this statue that represented all these, these kingdoms of the world. And then this, this uh, rock that became a mountain when it, it came and, and knocked down the statue and, and grew and grew and grew. And here's what Daniel says about that dream. In the time of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, get this, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Christ himself is the rock not cut by human hands. He is not manufactured. He is not made up. He is the altar in this story because he is the one who takes down everything that stands in the way of us having a relationship with God. And that includes these curses. He took them on. Galatians 3.13 says, Do you remember the scripture that says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree? That is what happened when Jesus was nailed to the cross. He became a curse and at the same time dissolve the curse. It is completely taken care of in him. Hallelujah. And on the blessing side of things, he's the one who completely obeyed everything that God ever commanded perfectly. Ephesians tells us this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every single one is ours in Jesus. Every single one is ours. And it's because his perfect obedience has made it possible for God the Father to, to now pour out on us all that generosity, all that goodness and grace and blessing. He can now reconnect his voice and his touch in our hearts in a way that we can receive without our disobedience being the barrier that it once was because Christ himself is our rock. What a great picture story this is for us, not just of who he is, but also of our response to him. Because this story describes God's people there as they're gathered at the base of those mountains and they are, they are centering themselves around the ark. They, they are oriented towards that as the, the focus of God's presence among them. They're not distracted by the curses that were potential or the potential blessings. They're instead focused on his persons and presence there with them. And the story uh, tells us specifically who was part of that gathering. It says that it included the marginalized, the other, the foreigner. And it's as if God is, is wanting to point out specifically, this story is for you. This message, you're included in it. And as I was thinking about where we are at, facing our own new territory, because it really is a new world for us, for all of us as Christians and for the church, going, what is it like in this crazy, turbulent, fast-paced world right now? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What does it mean to be a community of followers what are going to be the old truths that ground us and yet enable us to advance and, and to adapt and keep moving? It feels to me like the kind of world that we're living in is really an either or kind of world. It's a world that wants you to choose a camp or a tribe and then separate and, and be split off from people who are on the other side. There's all kinds of divisions on every, every level, in every aspect of our lives right now. Our culture is just wired that way, trying to get us to, to pick and choose and then uh, judge people who are in a different category. I don't think 
as God's people, we're called to be either or people. I think we are called to be both and people. We are called to be both about God's holiness and about his love. To sit in that tension of, of focusing on both, of holding on to both, knowing good and well that we can't achieve either. To stay in the center of that, though centered around the very presence of Christ, who is the one who gives us both. Christ himself is both mountains. I think about Psalm 125 that says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Christ, like those mountains, hems us in. He is our both and. He's the one that enables us to occupy that space. And it's only as we become more both and people that we can offer any kind of counterpoint toward the world's either or message. It's only as we become more both and people that we can demonstrate what the kingdom of God really looks like because that's what keeps us in that place of dependence on Christ where, where we recognize that we can't hang on to his holiness or his love. And, and it's as we remember our need that we see that it's a level playing field. We're no better than anybody else. And anybody, anybody who wants to respond to what Christ is offering is welcome because what he has done for us is big enough for all of us because he is our rock that has demolished all the strongholds. I was reading recently that that we're no longer in a society where people are seeking out the church for their problems. They're just not naturally doing that. That is not happening culturally anymore. The only way people are finding the message of Jesus is when they are receiving a personal invitation from somebody, when there is a relationship that is in place. And those kinds of relationships only happen when we are both and kinds of people. Because if you're either or, then you're only going to be occupied with people who are already in your group. You're going to be afraid of those outside. And you're going to be afraid of change in the world. And we don't want to be afraid. We want to be people who, who believe that Jesus really is enough. What does that look like for us moving forward? This is what I want you to be thinking about this week and praying about. And I would just encourage you to pray along three lines this week. First off, be praying for New Day's leadership. We've got a lot of big choices and decisions ahead of us, some of which we can't even make yet. But, but we need your, your continued prayers as we are in this together. We need full engagement of the full body of Christ. So be praying for leadership. Secondly, be praying for yourself. Go, God, where have I been more of an either or kind of person? And what does it look like for me to move more towards both and caring both about your holiness and your love? What does that even mean and what does that look like? And thirdly, is there someone, an individual person that you can name who you consider to be an other in your life? Someone on the outside, on the margins, who you can begin praying for that normally you wouldn't. That normally uh, would be outside your scope and say, God, soften my heart toward this person. Help me be a vehicle of the message that what Jesus has done uh, is enough for them as well. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that an old story about two small hills can show us so much about Jesus. Uh, and thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the truth that he's our rock. And, and God, we want to be both and people. We want to care about the things that you care about. We want to recognize our dependence on you. And God, we want to be a welcoming community. So show us how to do that, Lord, in this really challenging, strange time. Help us not to be afraid. And we give ourselves to you, even for this next upcoming week. Guide us. Bless us, we pray. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.